Good morning, church. Yeah, at least you sound a little bit more alive now. <laughs> I think still not enough. Why don't you get up on your feet right now? Go to at least three person and say it's good to see you this morning. Come on. Hallelujah. Now, definitely, we are a little bit warmed up. Huh? It's good. Very good morning also to those joining us online. And good that you can join us today. I just really want to say a little bit uh, about the church camp before I get into the sermon today. You know, indeed, uh, it dawned upon me this week also when I was praying that we are about two weeks away from camp. So, you know, in my prayer for, for the church and for the camp specifically, I, I really sense that, you know, God was, was saying that, you know, to me, I just really sense that the Spirit, Holy Spirit was saying that I will be there, but are you ready? I will be there, but are you ready? I really want to challenge all of us, you know, those of us, many of us are going for the camp. I think it's important for us to, to prepare our hearts and our spirit before the camp. You know, the camp is not just a time of great fellowship, good food, and all in KL, right? But I think we really want to go there and have a, a wonderful time encountering uh, God and the Holy Spirit. So it is important that we begin to prepare our hearts before that. You know, in these two weeks, I really encourage you to, to pray and ask God, say, God, uh, show me what you have in store for me at the camp. Let me encounter you. Shall we do that? Yeah? Right, come, let's get into the sermon for today. You know, recently I had two chance encounters with two ex-colleagues of mine. You know, they had one thing in common, but two very different responses and then very different trajectories thereafter in their lives. You know, the first colleague was an ex-church leader in a local church. You know, unfortunately, he committed sin and was asked to step down from, uh, his, the, the, from leadership in his church, in a local church. I understood that there were efforts by the church to try to restore him as a, a, a Christian brother. Perhaps it was the embarrassment and perhaps it was that potential awkwardness, but he chose not to receive the counselling and the restoration and, and left the church. And recently when we met, he was still not in any church, in, in fact. And then the second colleague that whom I chanced upon recently as well, similar, and similar life situation, I would say. He was also an ex-church leader. He was caught in a very bad debt situation because of bad investments, his life then spiraled out of, of control thereafter. He began to borrow a lot of money, uh, not to repay his debts, but to splurge them on, on, on women and alcohol. You know, his, his family began to break apart. His wife wanted to divorce him, and, and he, was, he was telling me then that the children had stopped talking to him because they lost the respect for him as a father. You know, we thank God uh, that, you know, God did a restoration work in him because, you know, the, the situation was so bad and his family situation got so bad that he actually sent a suicide note to a message rather to a few friends and thank God the friends found him just in time. Actually, he, he really tied a noose and ready to commit suicide. You know, he, he, he then received treatment and counselling. He recommitted his life to, to God and worked hard on restoring the family and repaying his debts. You know, some time ago, he told me that, you know, his wife and him has uh, reconciled. His relationship with his children were restored also. Then as a family, you know, they are all now serving in the church. And more amazingly, he committed a large part of his monthly salary and all his bonuses each year to repay the $300,000 debt that he, and he was finally debt-free. You know, this life experience impacted the family so much that you know, he told me one of his daughters actually is now a full-time pastor in the church and is active, he himself is actively volunteering in an organization to help counsel people in debt situations. You know, the whole family is then now actively and, uh, uh, attending and serving God in the church. You know, two chance encounters, two responses to sins in their lives and two very different outcomes in life thereafter. You know, these meetings prompted me to re-meditate on how we ought to respond to, to sins in our lives. And hence the topic to today, you know, restoration from sins. 
In the last month, I preached on the fear of God and a brother came to me after service to, to thank me and share that you know, it is so important for us as the believers, as Christians, to also have a good understanding on how we ought to respond to sins in our lives when we commit them. And hence, today, I would like to explore this topic together, restoration from sin. You know, I know this can be such an uncomfortable topic because it is, so, it is not easy to acknowledge sin in our lives and to do with them. It can be embarrassing. We sometimes do not want to confront sin because of shame. We do not want to confront sins because we fear the consequences. So before we begin, starting into this topic today, I really want to say that it is important for us Christians to acknowledge sins in our lives and to deal with them. This is because there are usually a few different trajectories from sins in our lives. One trajectory is that we are so condemned by our sins that we, we get persistently trapped in self-condemnation, not able to break through. The other trajectory is when people do not acknowledge sins in their lives and continue to live lives that are harmful to themselves, to people around them, and hurt God at the same time. So instead, today we want to look at one example in the Bible to see how the trajectory from sin should be which is to acknowledge sins in our lives, to deal with them, and to receive God's restoration for us. You know, most of us are not living in sin, so, but I ask that we do not you know, shut this message out today because you know, it, this message is important because it is important for us as Christians to understand the biblical teaching on this matter. You know, we are not infallible. When we fall, when we fail, we need to know how we ought to deal with sin. We need to understand also that uh, this also, because we, we need to have, sometimes we need to walk alongside fellow brothers and sisters struggling with sin, to come alongside, to walk with them towards restoration. Hence, I, I really encourage you to, to open up your heart, your spirit this morning to receive this message, whether it's for you or for somebody. All right? And for some of us who are really dealing with sins in our lives, this morning, I encourage you not to run away or shy away. Now, I believe that God is here not just to convict us, but also to help us journey and take this journey towards restoration. Why don't we return to the Lord in the word of prayer and ask God to help us in this study today? Father God, we want to thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you that God, invite each time as your people gather to worship you, we know that, Lord, you are in this place. God, we know that, Lord, you are here not just to, to receive the glory and honour that we ascribe unto you, but, Lord, we know that you, God our Father, is here to minister to your people this morning. So, Lord, even right now as we, we open up our hearts to receive your word, Lord, we want to ask that, Lord, you will speak to us. Father, we want to ask that, Lord, you will take away, we put, help us put aside every sense of, of defensiveness, but instead to ask and that, Lord, you will come and, and examine our hearts this morning and speak to us. For we pray all this in the Lord's most precious name. And let all God's people say, Amen. I invite you to turn to the Word of God in 2 Samuel chapter 12. I'm going to read from verse 1 to 23. I'm reading from the NIV. A very familiar story about the confrontation of the prophet Nathan with King David about his sin. And we want to see through the life and the response of King David how actually he walked from that episode of confrontation of his sin to repentance and finally restoration. Right In verse 1, it says, The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, there, was, there were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a, a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little lamb he had bought. He raised it and he grew up with him and his children. He shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. He was like a daughter to him. Now a traveller came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveller who had come to him. Instead, he took the lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for the lamb four times over. 
because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one who is close to you, and he will sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David and became ill. David pleaded with God for the, for the child. He fasted and spent the nights lying in sackcloth on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused and he would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child died. David's attendants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought while the child was still living, he wouldn't listen to us when we spoke to him. How can we now tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. David noticed that his attendants were whispering among themselves and he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead? He asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground. After he had a wash, put on lotions and changed his clothes, he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house and at his request, they served him food and he ate. His attendants asked him, why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept, but now the child is dead, you get up and eat? He answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Now today we will look at how King David actually recovered from that episode of sin that he was confronted with by, by, with, by Nathan and you know how he actually recovered from that, restored by God to become the man after God's own heart. You know, we want to look at the life of David to begin to look at, you know, the process that he took. You know, there was a process that David took from confrontation all the way to restoration. And this is the roadmap for us today. Five things I want to share with you today. I know when, whenever the preacher tells you there are five things they want to share with you, you get worried, right? But the whole way we will define. And these are important things that we need to understand. Each concept is important for us to understand the entire process that we need to take from sin to restoration. All right, the first thing I want to share with you is about confrontation and conviction of our sins. I want to share that, you know, that when we are confronted with sin in our lives, you know, instead of running away, instead of being in denial, it is important for us to be convicted by the Holy Spirit of our sins. And that is an important step. I will share more later. Secondly, I want to share with you about confession, repentance, and forgiveness. How important it is for us, having been confronted about our sin, we must learn to confess and how, you know, with repentance, the Lord will forgive. Thirdly, we talk about the consequences of our sin. I'm going to share with you, even if after receiving forgiveness, you know, there are some consequences, earthly consequences of our sins that we need to live with. And how we respond to these consequences is also important. Fourthly, I'm going to share with you this whole concept of restitution. And sometimes, you know, there are things, you know, that, you know, there are restitution that we need to make in life as a result of our sin. Finally, I want to bring God's assurance of restoration upon us if we truly 
are repentant before God. Now, don't worry about each of these terms as we will define them as we go along. Firstly, confrontation and conviction of our sins. You know, the account in 2 Samuel 12 began with a confrontation by the prophet Nathan with David about his sin of adultery and murder. You know, for those of us who are not familiar with the story, let me quickly summarize the account which you can read in 2 Samuel 11 of what actually happened. Why did Nathan have to confront David? You know, David was the king then, the one, one who was well-respected and a very, very successful king, I would say. You know, one day, instead of fighting with his men at the front lines of the battle, he chose to remain in his battle. And there, he saw a beautiful woman by the name of Bathsheba and ended up committing adultery with her. And he did not just stop there. He tried to cover up his sin by first trying to get Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, to come back from the battlefield to sleep with Bathsheba because Bathsheba was pregnant with David's child. You know, when he failed to convince Uriah to do so, he then skimmed the death of Uriah at the front line. In short, David committed adultery and murder. Of course, in the eyes of the Lord, there is no such thing as big sin, small sin, or serious sins and not so serious sin. A sin is a sin. But you know, by our human standards, David committed the serious sins of murder and adultery. You know, one cannot get away with murder, but David literally rest, was restored from, from murder. You know, with this as the background, let us look at how David dealt with his sins and how he was restored to be the man after God's own heart. You know, the first step towards restoration from our sin is to confront our sin. Confrontation of our sins can be by others, by our conscience, and by the Holy Spirit. Let me elaborate. You know, in David's case, he was confronted by Nathan. God actually sent Nathan to confront David. God can sometimes use others to confront us of our sins. God can bring a brother and sisters to point out certain things that is not right in our lives. And it is important for us to recognize that this confrontation, you know, is, is from God also. That he, God can use people to confront us. And it is important for us to respond correctly. To this confrontation. Sometimes our conscience can tell us that we have made a moral mistake that is sinful in the eyes of God. You know, our conscience is the inner sense of moral goodness that we all have. You know, based on this inner sense of, of, of moral goodness of our conscience, we can be convicted of immoral acts or, or, or acts that is, you know, considered sin in the eyes of God. God can also use, uh, can also directly confront us on our sins. We saw several examples of that in the Bible. For example, in Acts chapter 9, Jesus appeared before Saul and, and asked him why he was persecuting him and his disciples. Jesus was also confronted an immoral woman in an adulterous relationship in John chapter 4. So, you know, God can use others, God can use our conscience, and God can speak directly to us to confront us of our sins. So it is not how... We are being confronted of our sins that's important. But how we respond to our sins, how we respond to our confrontation, that is important. No matter how we are confronted on our sins, we, how we respond to the confrontation is important. Why? Because it shapes the trajectory that we take thereafter. We often you know, respond defensively when we are confronted, isn't it? We can respond in denial. We can respond in self-justification. Let me give you an example. You know, the day before I prepared this sermon, my, my daughter came to me with a candy that he took from the brother's room, you know, and asked me if she can eat it. You know, when the daughter comes to you and asks whether she can eat it, uh, she's not asking for permission. She's asking for my endorsement. And she's asking for my protection in case the mother asks you out there after. So, so, so I asked her, what did I do? I asked her, Hey, Sarah, are you sure that Ethan gave this to you? She replied, yes, immediately and emphatically, you know. So what did I do? Of course, I don't quite believe, lah, you know, because we had taught Ethan not to give her candies, right? So I called, can, uh, I don't candy. I called Ethan to my room. I said, Ethan, do you give uh, Sarah the candy? 
panicking before Ethan could answer. Sarah, panicking, she immediately said, I took it myself, but Ethan did not say no. Uh, uh, what was the response? Like, yeah, and the, the, he didn't say no, so that was an endorsement. Means okay, right? Yeah. So what just happened? See, when confronted, her immediate action was denial. And when pressed further, it graduated to rationalizing. Then she went one step further. She volunteered the information. Ethan also ate a lot of candy. <laughs> what is this called? In Cantonese, you saw Lam Chia Chai Say, you know. Uh, you want to die? Don't die alone. Make sure somebody dies together with you. <laughs> you know, we, we laugh at this seemingly harmless, childlike response. But actually, the truth is that she sinned, right? By, by stealing and then lying. But do you realize that this is sometimes how we adults respond when confronted to? Denial. When denial doesn't work, we justify. And justify, justification doesn't work sometimes we get somebody else to die together with us. Lah. Isn't it? So instead, as God's children, we should allow the Holy Spirit to convict us of our sins and start this journey towards restoration. What is conviction by the Holy Spirit? John chapter 16, verse 8, it says, When the Holy Spirit comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. See, the conscience is given to men, regardless if we are a believer or not. But as Christians, apart from our conscience, we have the Holy Spirit in us, who will prompt us on what is good and what is bad, what is acceptable and not acceptable by the standards of God. This is what the Holy Spirit can do for us, and this is how the Holy Spirit can convict us on what is right and what is wrong in the eyes of God, and what is sin and what is not. Hence, the Holy Spirit can convict us of our sins, and this is what the verse says, if we allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to bring conviction into our, of our sins. The truth is that, you know, the Holy Spirit can convict, but sometimes we can don't allow the Holy Spirit to convict us. You know, while we have the Holy Spirit in us, we can choose to suppress the voice of the Holy Spirit by disallowing the Holy Spirit to convict us. We can ignore the Holy Spirit. We can intentionally not want to hear what God is saying to us. For example, are there times, you know, before you sin, you know, you, you have this, already have this prompting that whatever you're going to do is no good. But what do we do? We suppress that voice and carry on to do what we want to do. Right? Sometimes we do that, isn't it? That's how we can suppress the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So the, the Holy Spirit is ready to convict us as, as believers, but we need to learn to allow the Holy Spirit to convict us too. Hence, when we are confronted on our sins, the first step to recovery is to allow the Holy Spirit to convict us and choose to receive discipline and restoration instead of being defensive and reject the recovery. How did David re begin his journey towards recovery? When confronted by Nathan, he was neither defensive nor self-justifying. His first words in verse 13 were, I have sinned against the Lord. He did not even go on to, 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 with a but, you know. I have sinned against the Lord, but because. He didn't even do that. He just said these words, I have sinned against the Lord. He just recognized and confessed that he has sinned against God. Next, let us talk about confession, repentance, and forgiveness. You know, when we are confronted on our sin, it is important that then, after the conviction of the Holy Spirit, for us to begin that journey towards restoration. And the first thing that we need to do in that journey is to confess our sins. Confession is defined by the Cambridge Dictionary as the act of admitting that you have done something wrong. Applying to what we are talking about today, confession is admitting that we have sinned. You know, that was exactly David's first response after being confronted on his sin. He confessed that he had sinned against God. After confrontation and conviction, we must take the first step to confess our sins. You know, this is an important step because confession is to acknowledge that we have sinned. 
And without this acknowledgement that we have sinned, why would we need forgiveness and restoration? You do not need restoration, you do not need forgiveness if you don't even acknowledge that you have sinned. So confession is the important first step that we need to do in that restoration process. 1 John 1.9, 1, a verse that we are all so familiar with, right? And what, what a wonderful promise of God. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But what is the first thing we need to do? Confess our sins. However, confession can sometimes not be as easy as it appears. We can be concerned about embarrassment. We can be concerned about judgment. We can be concerned about consequences. You know, all these concerns are real. However, we cannot be restored from our sins unless we face up to this and confess our sins. Proverbs 28, verse 13, it says, Whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the man who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. If we want to find the mercy of God, we need to learn to confess. This verse is clear that we will find the mercy of God when we learn to confess. And actually, confession of sins is not just before God. The Bible also encourages us to confess our sins to one another too. In James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Why are we encouraged to do that, to, to confess our sins to one another? This is because when we confess our sins to one another, we learn to be accountable to one another and also to lean on the support of one another, our brothers and sisters, especially in prayer. This is not easy, but we should take heed of the instructions of God on confession. Let us move on. What is next after confession? Confession is, of course, to declare that we are wrong. What is next after that? We need to move from confession to repentance. <coughs> so it's confrontation, then your confession, then we need to move to repentance. Repentance is defined by the Oxford Dictionary as the act of showing that you are sorry for what you have done. But I particularly like the definition in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. It says repentance is to turn from sin and dedicate oneself to the amendment of one's life. It says it is not just saying that you're sorry, it is to turn from sin and then dedicate your life to do exactly the different, to amend your life to a different trajectory. People often ask, what is the difference between confession and repentance? No, confession is to acknowledge that you are wrong. Repentance is the desire to turn from the sin and dedicate yourself to live differently therefore. See, it's two different things. Confession is to acknowledge that you're wrong, but repentance is to, to turn away from that sin and dedicate yourself to live differently thereafter. Who was David repentant after his confession of sin? You know, the passage in 2 Samuel 12 did not specifically detail that. But you know, through the actions of David thereafter, we could see his desire to turn his life around. He did not commit adultery or murder again. He sought to live a life that pleases God. In fact, he, he did so well that God actually, you know, lists him as one of the heroes of faith. You know, faith, Psalms 51 was written by David immediately after Nathan confronted him of his sin. And in it, David said, listen to this from Psalm 51. Say, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgression. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. You know, from David's response in Psalms 51, you could sense that he was truly repentant. He acknowledged that he had sinned and that God was right in his verdict. In fact, even when God took away the child he had with Bathsheba later, instead of being angry, he accepted that this is the consequence of his sin. You know, we will talk more about that later. Then in verse 10 and 11 of Psalm 51, listen to this. He asked of God, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. 
Do not cast me from your presence or take the Holy Spirit from me. He wanted his life to turn from sin to one that is pure before God. That was his heart cry to God. Do you see David's response? After confessing his sin, he's truly repentant in that he, he, he did not just want forgiveness. He wanted his life to turn from the sinful, sinful man that he was into someone who is after God's heart. That was his cry to God. And that is a sign of repentance. Where there is confession, we need to then repent thereafter. But where there is confession and repentance together, I want to assure you that there will be forgiveness from God. It's important for us to learn to confess our sins and be genuine in our confession and be repentant. And when we do that, there's a promise of forgiveness. This is an important truth that we, will, we need to always remember. If we want forgiveness, we need to confess and repent. Likewise, when we confess and repent, we must be, be, be sure. In fact, we must be confident that we will receive forgiveness. Let me elaborate. In verse 13, verse part B, David was told by Nathan, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. In the New Living Translation, it says, the Lord has forgiven you and you will not die for this sin. You know, from the verse, it was very clear from the declaration of, of the prophet Nathan that God forgave David for what he did. We must always hold on to the assurance of forgiveness from God because that is the promise from God. 1 John 1.9, we, we, we quoted that earlier. Listen to this again. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That is the everlasting promise of God. That is the Word of God. Even in the Old Testament, the Lord had consistently demonstrated that He forgave the sins of people if they are genuine with the confession and repentance. For example, Moses was a murderer too, isn't it? And the Lord forgave him and used him as a servant to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. Abraham was, a, was impatient with God and acted you know, on his own to have a child with his maid servant instead of waiting for the promised child by God. God forgave him and used him as the father of the generations. Jacob deceived his brother Esau and was quite a nasty character, isn't he? But the Lord encountered him face to face and used him. And we have an even greater assurance of God's willingness to forgive us when Jesus went to the cross and paid the price of our sins. 1 Peter 3, 18, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just and the unjust, so that He may bring us back to God and having put to death in the flesh, made alive in the Spirit. Jesus went to the cross, died for our sins. Why? Because He's always willing to forgive when we confess and ask Him for forgiveness. Hence, we need to learn to confess and to repent and thereafter to be confident of the forgiveness of God. But there's one more important thing that I want to say and we need to understand before I move on to the next point. Repentance is not self-condemnation. Listen to this. Repentance is not self-condemnation. Some people sometimes mix up the two. Some people think that true repentance is when we are so sorry that we need to constantly remind ourselves, rebuke ourselves, and almost condemning ourselves all the time. You know, we're almost led to believe that if you you somehow remember sins of your past and you don't feel sorry anymore for those and you can get out so easily from it, it means you are not repentant. It means you are not serious about, about your repentance. Is that correct? That is not repentance. That is self-condemnation. And repentance is not self-condemnation. No, 1 John 3.20, it says, By these we know that we are of the truth. We shall assure our hearts before Him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. The verse says that even if our hearts 
condemns us, even if there's self-condemnation, God is greater than our hearts and God does not condemn us. This is what the verse is saying. Romans 8.1, therefore, there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No, it is important for us to understand that. We do not need to condemn ourselves to justify God's forgiveness for us. Jesus has settled that. When Jesus went to the cross and declared that it is finished, it is finished. You need to understand that. When Jesus went to the cross and said, it is done, it is done. But the devil will want us to believe otherwise. The devil will lead us into sin and then condemn us and want us to remain in the condemnation so that we can never break free from that and live the free life and victorious life that Jesus wants us to. It's important for us to, to confront this, this lie of the devil one and declare that indeed Jesus said, it is done, it is finished. So hence, it is important for us to understand fully the importance of our confession and our repentance and can claim with all conviction the forgiveness of Jesus Christ when we sin. Are you following me? Look very serious. Maybe I'm very serious. Eh? Turn to your neighbor say, there is no condemnation in Jesus Christ. Declare it, come on. <coughs> Simple words, but an important declaration. Let us move on. Next, I want to spend some time talking about consequences of our sins. You know, some people think that after we confess our sins and receive, you know, uh, God's forgiveness, everything is settled. It is indeed settled as far as forgiveness is concerned. Indeed, as I said just now, it is finished. Jesus declared that it is finished. But there could still be earthly consequences that we need to face and deal with. Let me elaborate. In verse 15, after Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David and became ill. In verse 18, on the seventh day, the child died. David committed adultery with Bathsheba. As a result, they had that illegitimate child. And the child was struck with illness and died. It was prophesied by Nathan that it was a consequence of their sin. Now, while we will always receive the forgiveness of, of God when we confess and repent, there might still be consequences of our sins that we need to face. For example, if we commit a crime, there will be consequences if we are convicted by the law, even though God has forgiven you. You know, in the example of the second colleague whom I mentioned at the start of the sermon, he still had to deal with the debts and, and broken family relationships even after he repented before God. You know, after you repent, doesn't mean, you know, God will miraculous, I mean, God will take away all the consequences. Because, you know, while God is the loving God who forgives you, God is also the just God. And God is also the, the, the God of justice that we have to be, you know, be accountable for what we've done. And that is the consequences that we need to face. So, it doesn't mean that, you know, when, when God is a God of love, we do not need to face the consequences of our, our sins. At the same time, it doesn't mean that, you know, it, because we have to face the consequences of our sin, that God is not loving. You following me? Because God is both. You know, our sins can harm ourselves and others and hurt God. And these are the consequences also. See, when David knew the consequences of his sins, he prayed and pleaded with God. In 2 Samuel 1, 16 to 17, it says, David pleaded with God for the child. Then when God allowed the death of the child, David responded in verse 22 to 23. He says, you know, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him and he will not return to me. You see, David accepted the consequences of his sin. He knew that it is not because God was evil to let the child die. He knew that that was the consequences of his sin. He knew that, he's displeased, uh, that he displeased God, and that's why in Psalms 51, he pleaded to God to create in him a clean heart. 
Then instead of being angry with God when the child was taken away, he held on to the confidence of God's mercy and grace by declaring that I will go to the child and the child will not return to him. What did he mean? He was saying that he will be united with the child in eternity. Do you know this is a statement of confidence? Confident that God has forgiven him, confident that God has restored him to his, even his eternal, his, to his, in eternity. That was the confidence of David in God's forgiveness. So church, we need to learn to also accept the consequence of our sins, the consequences of our sin. We can plead with God like what David did. But if consequences of our sin remains, we must accept it and not be bitter. We need to understand that there are consequences not because God is insistent on punishing us for our sins, but because God is a just God and there are cause and effects of our sins. I must admit that this is not easy, but we need to ask God to help us, especially when we're going through it. You know, it is strange that sometimes people get, ang- can get angry with God when they have to face consequences in their, for their sins. They question how a loving God can do that and still punish us even though we have already confessed our sin and be repentant. They question how a loving God can do that. Ultimately, it is important for us to remember that these are consequences of our sins and that while God is a loving God, He is also a God of justice. Now, before I move to the last point for today, I want to say something about this concept of restitution. <coughs> now, let's look at the definition of restitution. The dictionary defines restitution as the action of serving to bring restoration of a previous state. For example, if you have cheated someone of money or something, making restitution is to pay the person back, even though you have already faced the consequences of being exposed or even the consequence of the law. If you have destroyed something belonging to someone else, you know, making restitution is to repair or to replace what you have destroyed. You know, this concept of restitution is important for us to understand because it's, it's the full process from confrontation all the way to a confession and forgiveness, even with consequences there are times that we need to make restitution to the people who we have been offended or have sinned against. While it was not clearly detailed in the example of David in 2 Samuel 12, today's study will not be complete without this understanding. So let me say something briefly about restitution. You know, in David's case, the closest we got to seeing some form of restitution was him taking Bathsheba as his wife. But not, not quite the restitution that that we, we, we think it should be, isn't it? And ironically, David actually understood the concept of restitution. See, Nathan, when Nathan confronted David with the story of how the rich man exploited the poor man by taking his lamb, David said in verse 6 that the rich man must pay for the lamb four times over. He was saying that not only must the rich man pay back what he took, he must make restitution by even paying four times over. He understood what it, what it is. Uh, uh, that, I mean, he understand, understood the concept of restitution, even when he said that. And another biblical example of repentance and restitution was captured in Luke chapter 19. You know, after encountering Jesus, it was recorded in Luke chapter 19, verse 8, that the tax collector Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Lord, look, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. This is restitution. You see, as a tax collector, Zacchaeus would have unfairly extorted and taken money from people. After he encountered Jesus, he was deeply convicted of his sins and and hence he made the declaration of restitution. So there is a place for restitution sometimes in the offence that we have, that we make in the sin that we commit. Let me give you one, one more example of consequences and restitution. <clears throat> you know, years ago, I was driving when a car actually cut across two lanes from the right and crashed straight into my, my driver's side door. You know. I don't know how 
she could do that, you know, she was literally two lanes across. She literally did a 90 degrees. She wanted to make the turn in front of me and crash straight into me. You know, I, I, I literally you know, had to crawl out of my car because I couldn't open my car door, right? I came out of the car. And I remained calm and came down with the car and, and went to the, 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 the driver. You know, and to my amazement, instead of a sincere apology from the lady driver, I don't mean... <laughs> from the driver, from the driver. No, 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 no gender labeling here, okay? And I confronted the driver who happened to be a lady. <laughs> Instead of a sincere apology from that driver, she shouted at me and said, Why didn't you give way to me? Whoa! I tell you, at that point of time, I nearly had to call upon my pre believer past. I used, gave her a tirade of, uh, of words, you know. Thank God the only not-so-nice things that I said to her was to call her auntie when she's my age. La. <laughs> that made her even more ang angry. I said, auntie, why you do that? I said, what auntie, what auntie? I'm your age. <laughs> so I, that was intentional. I poked her a bit. Okay, so that's my sin too. La, huh? <laughs> I simmered and then I spoke to her properly. And sensing that, she calmed down and then finally apologised. Well, despite the apology, there are consequences of her inconsiderate driving, right? You know, it was reported to the police, she got her demerit points. So that's the consequence of the law. And more than that, because she crashed into me, the insurance company ruled that she's at fault, she had to pay for my damages. So that is restitution. You see that? The fault, the consequence, the restitution. I hope that through this lady's example, you could uh, understand the concept uh, of consequences and restitution. So confession, repentance, consequences, and restitution. These are important things in our restoration process from sin. And often, some, often people confuse consequences and restitution. Some may argue that if we have already been punished for our sins, why do we have to make good and make restitution? Well, especially for us Christians, we must learn to be honourable and our response to our sin and willingness for, to make restitution reflects also our true repentance. So making restitution demonstrates in a practical way the sincerity of our repentance. Let me move on to the last thing I will say to you today. You can even invite the worship team to just come and, and start to prepare to minister to us. Right? Now after we confess, we repent, and face up to the consequences and make restitution, we can expect restoration from God. We can expect restoration. Now, this might sound like a very presumptuous statement to say that God will restore us, but this is my conviction because this is the Father's heart. I'll come back to the Father's heart later, but let us look at how God restored David after his repentance. What happened to David after his repentance? David continued to serve as God's faithful king and throughout his life, he enjoyed the presence and the favour of God. Acts chapter 13, verse 22, he says, After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him. God himself testified concerning David. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything that I want him to do. God did not just forgive David. God restored David. Not only that, his legacy lived on. His son Solomon enjoyed the favor of the Lord and built the temple of God. And who were among the descendants of David? Jesus. Of course, we know Jesus was brought into earth through virgin birth, but you know, God can use the lineage of a sinful man to bring about the virgin birth of his son. David committed adultery, committed murder, but he was still a man after God's own heart, after he was restored. Why? Because among many things, he understood forgiveness, he understood repentance, he understood restoration. David 
had detoured from his destiny, but God definitely restored him. You now we can hold on to the confidence that when we genuinely repent of our sins and our mistakes, God will restore us. This is because I believe that the Father's heart is to restore. You know, the parable of the prodigal son was meant to describe the heart of God, our Father. And what a beautiful picture of restoration that was. I know this is such a familiar passage, but I really want to read it to you. I want you to receive in your spirit the Father's heart for restoration. <coughs> Luke chapter 15, verse 22, 20 to 24. It says, But while he was still a long way off, the younger son, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. We all know the parable well. The prodigal son took his inheritance from the father, squandered it with sinful living and decided to return to his father when he ran out of money. He correctly recognized that he had sinned against God and and the father. But look at the response of the father. The father had every right to be upset, every right to discipline, every right to reject the son. Now, what did he do? In verse 20, he told us that the father was filled with compassion. This is our father's father God, you know. Instead of looking at us, looking at us with contempt when we sin and say that you, you sinful boy, you sinful child. God, look at us with compassion. That is the heart of the Father. But the Father did more than that. He did not just have compassion and agree to the son's request for him to come back and work as a servant. Why? Because despite what he had done, his identity was his father's son and not his servant. Likewise, that is the heart of God, our Father. He looked at us, no matter if we have been faithful or wavered, as His sons and daughters, not just as a sinner who deserves punishment. The Father did not just have compassion. He actually restored the Son. In verse 22, He brought out the best robe, put a ring on the Son's finger, sandals on His feet and declared a feast. The robe, the ring, the feast, they were symbols of restoration. Not just forgiveness, but also restoration. And this is the heart of God, our Father. Now we can recover from our sins if we choose to respond correctly. Confess, face up to the consequences, make restitution and allow God to restore us. And this afternoon, as we bring the sermon to a close, you can put a cycle notes and uh, I just really want to invite you to spend some time tuning in and let the Holy Spirit speak to us. I know it is not easy to admit <coughs> or to be confronted on our sins. You know, who likes to be confronted? Who wants to be confronted? But it is important that we do not let this chance pass us by to come clean before God and receive restoration if we need to. You know, I really believe that there's some of us here who had sinned in the past. We might even have confessed, repented, and been restored from our sin. But there's this lingering sense of condemnation that refuses to go. We sometimes even feel that if we do not feel sorry anymore, it means that we are not truly repentant. Today, I want you to reject, I don't want to reject the lie and the condemnation in your life. Because when Jesus declared on the cross that it is done, it is done. 
I speak that in your spirit, man, today, if that's how you are feeling. It's not the words of Melvin Gunn. It is the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as He hung there on the cross. He said, it is finished. So do not let the devil tell you otherwise. If you have come before God, you have confessed and repented and restored. You are free before the Lord as a child of God again. I speak that in the spirit, man. Let God come and break the spirit of condemnation in your life today. That's how you have been feeling. Some of us maybe here are still dealing with certain things that are not right in our lives. You know, it's a sin before God. Maybe no one knows about it, only you. Maybe we have struggled with it for so long that we feel almost powerless to, to break free from it. But we know we need to deal with it. Will you come before God today and ask God to forgive you and help you and restore you? This is what we're going to do. We just invite you right now just to close our eyes, put aside our nose and close our eyes. I invite all of us to close our eyes. Even if you have nothing to respond before God this morning, just invite you to do so for the sake of your brother and sisters who, for their privacy and their response to God this morning. And with every eyes closed, I just invite you to now just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. You have been living in the condemnation. Would you ask the Holy Spirit? Would you ask God to come and set you free? If you know that there are some things that are not right in your life before God, would you come before God even right now? Confess and surrender to God. Just respond to God. Now with every eyes closed, this is what we want to do. Even the first group, you have sinned in the past, you have confessed, you have repented, but you know that there this condemnation has been plaguing you in your life. All this while. And today you know that you know this is not of God. I really believe that God is here to set some of us free from the condemnation. If that's who you are, with every eyes closed even right now, I just invite you to put your hand on your heart. And I'm going to pray for you in a short while. No one else is looking. Alright? And your response before God, put your hand on your heart and, and let God come and take away the condemnation that you know has been in your heart. Yes. Yes. For the second group, now some of you, you know that, you know, today God is here. And you know there are certain things that in your life that is not right before God. And it's so difficult sometimes to come and confess those things because it is so embarrassing. But right now, even before God, between you and God, you know, God is today is here, not here to condemn you, not here to judge you, but here to restore you. If that's who you are, if every eye is closed right now and again, I just invite you also to put your hand on your heart and we'll pray for you. Come before God and say, God, take away this sin in my life. Help me. Help me break free. Put your hand on your heart. If every eye is closed, then just join me in prayer for, for our brothers and sisters in our midst. Right? Father God, we want to thank you for your presence in this place, your gentle presence in this place. God, we want to thank you that God, you are God, our loving Father, who did not just have compassion on us as a God, you are a God who, who cares for us deeply and a God who is willing to restore. Father, even right now, I pray over my brothers and sisters who have been living in that guilt, been living in that condemnation. Father, in Jesus' name, and we stand on the authority of your Jesus Christ and declare that those things are not from God and in the authority of Jesus Christ, let every condemnation be broken in Jesus' name. We break it in Jesus' name and we speak freedom from the Lord Jesus Christ upon them 
And today, Father, I pray over them that, Lord, instead of condemnation, there will be this deep conviction of the love of God over them. There's this deep, deep conviction of the freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ over them. I speak that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Father, I'm going to pray for our brothers and sisters who are responding before you, needing your grace and your mercy. And Lord, even as they confess even their sins before you, Father, we thank you that, Lord, you are the God who loves them, that, Lord, you have promised us that you are faithful and just who will forgive them and cleanse them for all unrighteousness. Today, Father, I pray again, Father, for the forgiveness to be released upon them, not from me, but from the Lord Jesus Christ upon their lives. And Father, I pray that, Lord, indeed, you help them to walk in victory. Walk in victory, Father, in their lives, God. We thank you, and Lord, indeed, you are our God, our loving God, and in you, we can cling on to this promise that we can be free and free indeed. We bless you. Jesus' name we pray and let all God's people say, Amen. This is what I want to ask you to do to invite you to stand to your feet. I'm going to sing a response song today. I'm not going to invite you to come to the front, all right? So I really believe that, you know, it is your response before God. We're going to sing the response song. Let's begin to sing it as, you know, to God. And after the service, all right, I'm going to come back and release the rest. But if you need prayer, you know, there'll be pastors and elders who will be here at the front to stand with you to pray together on this matter or anything else that you need prayer for. Alright, come let's worship the Lord. God, what a wonderful reminder that amazing grace and Jesus hung there on the cross to die for our sins the forgiveness of the Father upon us once and for all Father, we want to thank you for your presence in this place, we want to thank you Father for the ministry in many of our hearts this afternoon Father, teach us not just to learn to recognize our sin, our mistakes, but teach us, Father, to be children, to be repentant and to live in honor of the price that Jesus paid on the cross. Live our lives in victory, in honor of the Father who loves us so. So even right now, even as we depart from this place, it's the love of the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the companionship of the Holy Spirit be upon you today and forevermore. 
For we pray all this in the Lord's most precious name and let all God's people say, Amen. Let's praise God, shall we? Hallelujah.